Hello, welcome everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on the place or the country you are. Uh, it's a pleasure for us to be organizing this activity today. Uh, as you know, this is our last uh, masterclass uh, that we organize uh, for the UCAM uh, Spanish Sport University e week. Uh, we have been doing different webinars, different master classes during all the week in English, and this is the last one for this uh, week. As I say, thank you very much for being here with us today. Uh, it is my pleasure to do the introduction to this uh, activity. Please, first of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Jose Carlos Diaz. I am the coordinator of UCAM Spanish Sport University and also academic coordinator of different programs related with uh, sport management and sport uh, performance. Um, then I would like to introduce uh, the moderator of this uh, session, of this activity, Mr. Pedro Emilio Alcaraz, director of UCAM Spanish Sports University, also director of the Master in High Performance in Sports. Uh, director of the Research Center for High Performance Sport of the UCAM, and also president of the Strength and Conditioning Society. Pedro, good afternoon, and thank you for also being with us today. Good afternoon, and welcome to this webinar organized by UCAM Spanish Sport University. My name is Pedro Alcaraz, and I am the director of Spanish Sport University and the master's degree in high performance sport, strength and conditioning at Tucan University. It's my pleasure for me to be here introducing uh, this last session of the Spanish Sport University e-week in English and sharing the, uh, the latest knowledge about strength and conditioning this afternoon with people from all over the world. First of all, I would like to, to thank uh, Brandt Schofer, Thomas Freitas, and Costas Espiru to be here with us. We know that you have a, a thick scooter. I would also thank Lucan, um, especially to my colleagues and collaborators, Juanjo and Jose Carlos, who are working really hard to make this event possible. Our first speaker, Brad Schofer, is PhD, CSCS, CSPS, FNSCA. is widely regarded as one of the Americans' leader a fitness, fitness expert. He's the, the author of multiple best-selling fitness, including his newest, The Max Muscle Plan. And he has been pu publishing uh, in the major fitness and women magazines and has appeared on hundreds of television shows and radio programs across uh, the United States. Brad received his PhD in Applied Exercise Science from Rocky Mountain University. He's currently a professor at the university and he's the director of the Human Performance Lab. The research focuses on the mechanisms of muscle hypertrophy and their application to resistance training. He has published tons of peer reviewed papers on top uh, journals uh, on exercise, hypertrophy, and sport nutrition. We have the great pleasure to come on him in our program as lecture too. So for us, it's a, an amazing opportunity for our students. And today, he's going to talk about aging and muscle development. Our second speaker, Thomas Freitas, is alumni of the master's degree in high performance sport. He gained his PhD last year on basketball uh, performance. He is now a lecturer and researcher at Ucan University, both in the uh, master's degree in high performance sport and in our bachelor in, 
in sports science in English. And today he's going to talk about our latest research in change of direction in team sport development uh, that we are uh, developing in collaboration with a nucleus of high performance sport in, in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And finally, our third speaker, Costas Espiru, is alumni of the master degree in high performance sport too. He is from, uh, he's Greek, and Thomas is from Portugal. And Costas Espiru is specifically in, uh, 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 last year got a scholarship at Tucan University to research about neuromuscular fatigue and injury prevention in futsal. He's working with one of the best in, in Europe, is El Pozo Futsal, and we are doing a lot of research about this topic. And today he's going to talk about current load monitoring practice, practices in elite futsal. In general, each one will expose the presentation in around uh, 20, 15, 20 minutes. And now I want to, to explain some rules that we need to respect in order to make easy the development of the conference. conferences. First, please don't touch any button during the presentations. This makes the speaker difficult his intervention. At the, at the end of the presentation, it will be open a question and answer session in which you will be able to ask your questions. To do so, we will use the chat. To make a question, please write your real name and spe specify the speaker to whom is the question addressed. It would be great if you could make the question as concise as possible. Thank you very much for being here, for sharing your time with us, with UCAN Spanish Sports University, with UCAN University. And now it's turn to Brad. Brad, please welcome and give you the floor. Enjoy the afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, gracias, Pedro. Um, hola a todos. Um, hablo español muy poquito, uh, pero yo estoy aprendiendo. Uh, es, pero es muy difícil. Uh, entonces hablaré en inglés. So let me see how to do this now. Um, okay. All right, so I'm going to discuss today about uh, muscle building across the lifespan, and in particular how uh, aging affects muscle growth and what we can do to uh, attenuate that, to reduce the effects. So there's a term called sarcopenia, and sarcopenia, uh, the definition of it is the loss of muscle tissue. And it actually extends somewhat past that. Uh, it is now taken also to mean a, a loss of strength and functionality as well. But the genesis is from a loss of muscle, a gradual loss of muscle as part of the aging process. And sarcopenia is now classified as a disease, at least in the United States it is. So uh, you can actually, as a doctor, as a medical doctor, uh, bill to treat sarcopenia medically. Uh, it has a what's called an ICD-10 code, which means that insurance will reimburse for it. Which, uh, to, to do that, you have to be classified as a disease. And it is diagnosed, the classic diagnosis of sarcopenia is to have a muscle mass at least two standard deviations below the healthy population mean in, com in combination with a slow walking speed. So uh, to diagnose it, you look for, number one, how much muscle mass do they have uh, in comparison to the healthy mean. So if they're above 90, if they're outside of the 95% of healthy uh, people, that would be the first uh, classification. And second, if they have a slow walking speed, because again, a loss of muscle the, uh, from a sarcopenic standpoint uh, to be classified, you'd need to have functional impairments. 
Now, the time course of muscle loss is dependent on various factors, but I'm going to give you some averages here. Uh, generally speaking, after the uh, after the, turn 30, the, the, the slides are not working. Sorry, maybe is the slides aren't they're working on my end. Uh, okay. Huh. Let's see. You don't see this uh, working? Yeah, we, we can see your the, the general uh, the introduction slide, the first slide. But for me, and I think for uh, for other. Um, people uh, is not working. It's not. Let me try this again. Um, Thank, you. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure what to do then. Uh, Brad, um, it's better if you stop sharing the screen. And when you try to share screen again, just uh, select the option of uh, all the screen. Share all the screen. Okay, so share application. Select window or screen, entire screen. Yeah. Okay. Let's try that. Uh, can you see this now? Is it changing? Have you? Yeah, we see it. Okay, perfect. Perfect okay. now. Perfect now. Thank you. Okay, so I, I'll just go through this. So again, sarcopenia is uh, the loss of muscle tissue. It is now classified as a disease and uh, you need at least two standard deviations below the population mean and a slow walking speed. I went through that quickly. Uh, so now we're back to where I left off. So on average, after about the age of 30 to 35, you start to lose about a half percent of your muscle mass per year. Uh, once you hit 50, once a person hits 50 years old, uh, they lose, it starts accelerating. They lose one to two percent. And then after 60, it goes up to 3% and even more into the 70s and 80s. So by the time someone turns 80, uh, many, if, assuming they are sedentary, largely sedentary, they could have lost half of their muscle mass uh, over time. And uh, you could see that in this graph uh, to the right here, that the peak, uh, peak age of muscle is somewhere around 35 or so, and then... Uh, it wanes. And, and again, this depends on the person. So as we'll talk about, uh, you can substantially reduce, uh, attenuate the loss of muscle by staying active. But the key point here is that uh, this, while sedentary people do show greater uh, rates of muscle loss than those who are active, simply just doing leisure time physical activity. So simply walking around a lot or gardening and doing general chores, it does reduce uh, sarcopenia, but it is not, um, it does not substantially attenuate muscle loss, reduce it. Now a little science here, um, muscle gain and muscle loss is predicated on muscle protein balance and that is muscle protein synthesis versus muscle protein breakdown. When muscle protein synthesis is higher than breakdown, you are in a net anabolic state, you're building muscle. When break, breakdown is higher than synthesis, you are losing muscle, that would be sarcopenia. And when they're even, when they're approximately equal over time, you will be staying approximately the same. Most people who do not exercise uh, or who do minimal exercise, will be in a protein balance until they're around 30 to 35. So in your younger years, protein synthesis and balance stay somewhat in equilibrium. It is after this period uh, that, assuming you do not do any particularly resistance training, that you will start to lose muscle mass. And um, some of this is theorized to be due to chronic inflammation that occurs. And particularly as we get older, as people get older, um, they develop a chronic inflammatory disease. Uh, body fat itself, the increase in, in fat in the body, uh, has been shown to increase chronic inflammation because fat is an endocrine organ, it actually endocrine tissue. It actually secretes um, inflammatory uh, molecules and inflammatory 
um, metabolites, if you will, or, or um, uh, uh, cytokines, meta inflammatory cytokines into the circulation. And uh, it's been shown that uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory uh, drugs actually will reduce this in, uh, inflammatory disease in elderly people and enhance muscle growth. And it's again, uh, specifically in elderly, it actually has negative effects in younger people uh, for other reasons. But in elderly, because apparently because of this reduced effect on inflammation, on chronic inflammation, uh, it actually helps to preserve muscle tissue. Now, I'm not advocating, and certainly there are negative um, aspects to taking non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So it is not really a treatment for sarcopenia, at least over the long term. Um, there are hormonal factors that are involved in muscle loss, chronic hormonal factors. So in men, uh, testosterone is the primary anabolic hormone. Well, the levels of testosterone are substantially reduced over time. And you can see in the graph on the right, um, uh, the numbers on the left are uh, testosterone levels and on the bottom, so on the y-axis are your uh, testosterone levels, on the x-axis are age and years. And you can see as a person gets to 80 on average, their T levels are almost half of what they were uh, when they were 40 years old. So uh, substantial negative effects on testosterone, and that is gonna have negative effects on ability to uh, build muscle. What a lot of people don't realize is estrogen in women is a anabolic hormone, and it seems to have even greater negative effects on women. Uh, because there's a greater reduction in estrogen. So estrogen is the primary female anabolic hormone. And once women go through menopause, which happens generally in the 40s for women, uh, they can show a uh, over a tenfold decrease in estrogen levels. And again, that's going to have negative effects on muscle building. Uh, there are microstructural changes that occur during sarcopenia, the primary one. Uh, there'll be uh, spaces within the, um, the uh, z sarcoplasm, and there's disruptions uh, in the myofilaments, to, my, to the myofibrils. So you can see, uh, this is a rodent study. The uh, uh, image on the left, uh, at 24 months, so in rodents, they have a lifespan of about two years. So obviously very small, short lifespan. 24 months would be a uh, younger, like a healthy, full adult rodent. On the right is an old rodent. Look at the difference in how the muscle looks. So uh, there's actually evidence that the type two fibers in particular will undergo what's called apoptosis, which is to die off. And you can see how the, in the uh, slide on the right, uh, with the 39 months, there's uh, absence of, of certain uh, fibers there. You can see they just basically have died off. And to the left, which you see uh, the um, images on the left, at top is uh, a young, it's an MRI, of a young, normal young healthy individual, so 18 to 25 years old. You can see the um, muscle mass that the individual had and take a look on the bottom so you can see the uh, dotted line would be the size of the thigh in the young individual and look at how look at how much um, sarcopenia has been the, the atrophy of that muscle so uh, autopsy results show that it's almost 20 percent uh, smaller, the uh, size of the quadriceps, almost 20% smaller in elderly than in younger. So, uh, and, and that accompanies a reduction of about 25% in total fiber numbers. There's also a negative effect on what we call satellite cells. So satellite cells are muscle stem cells. They uh, uh, donate nuclei to uh, muscle cells. That helps muscle cells regenerate repair themselves and grow. And uh, there is a markedly reduced uh, activation of these satellite cells, and thus it makes it more difficult for 
muscle repair and regeneration during, during elderly times. The good news is that it's never too late to start aging. Now, I will say that if you actually start uh, resistance training when you are young, and by the way, resistance training, uh, we think of it as lifting weights, but it's really any type of resistance. Body weight resistance training is a form of resistance training that can be very effective using resistance bands. So there's other things than just free weights. So machines, cables can be used. But resistance training itself, if you do it when you're younger, you can actually stave off this aging process and, and substantially reduce sarcopenic changes and have functional preserve fu functional capacity into very late old age. Um, but even if you did not do anything, or if an individual, uh, let's say, was inactive into their 70s, uh, there is very good evidence. We actually have a meta-analysis in review showing huge improvements in very old 75 plus years of age individuals uh, by taking on fairly short-term resistance training. So eight to 12 weeks show massive improvements uh, in their strength and in their muscle mass. Uh, so the hypertrophic gains of uh, over 20% can be attained in type one, type two fibers, again, within very sh fairly short periods of times and uh, up to 15.6% increases in the very elderly, so 75 years old. Um, now, with that said, the growth response will be blunted in older versus younger individuals. Um, there is an anabolic resistance. Uh, obviously, when hormone levels are, are reduced, anabolic hormone levels, testosterone, estrogen, there's going to be negative effects on the ability to build muscle. And uh, thus, there's going to be more um, or, or a blunted response. And there's also more non-responders to exercise uh, as people age. So they will, not, they will not respond as rapidly. More individuals, like if you look at a group of, uh, take a, a cohort of people, the number of people who don't respond will be greater with the uh, elderly. Uh, now, Part of that also is due to uh, what's called anabolic insensitivity. Uh, there is reduced intracellular signaling from uh, the aging process. So there's a uh, downstream intracellular signaling enzyme called uh, P70S6K, which is a, uh, an enzyme that regulates protein translation. Uh, that is substantially uh, reduced, the activation of it is substantially reduced. And uh, you can see that the fractional rate of muscle protein synthesis in the graph on the right is lower uh, after a exercise bout. And, and this was, uh, you can see this is with all forms of, of resistance training intensity. So 15%, one arm, 30%, 45%. So anything between 15% uh, to 90% 1RM, the response in the elderly was reduced. Uh, another thing is that uh, the elderly will not be able to recover as well. Uh, what this shows is, is that um, high volume programs and, and high frequency programs tend to be not, um, I, I would say, uh, they, they would be less applicable to elderly. They won't be able to tolerate as much volume. Now, interestingly, uh, there is a there's some research showing that in periods of detraining, uh, elderly people need to have higher volume. So younger people are able to train with very minimal volumes and still maintain their muscle mass, where older people need to make, if you keep reducing their volume, they don't maintain the mass. So even though older people can't tolerate as much volume, they have to stay with that volume. Reducing the volume will tend to have negative effects. Uh, as far as the load, um, elderly people respond to uh, a spectrum of loading ranges. Anything 30% and above has been shown to promote very robust hypertrophy and even lower levels in the elderly 
uh, 20%. There's some evidence that very light loads even in the elderly. And it's important to consider, too, that elderly tend to have greater uh, increases in, uh, this should be well known, but uh, in osteoarthritis. So arthritic conditions are increased, and thus training with lighter loads can reduce joint stress and thus create greater adherence to lifting. Uh, frequency, as I mentioned, the recovery is not as robust, so uh, elderly generally will not be able to handle as frequent training. Usually two to three days a week would be more applicable, having like at least a day between each session. When you start having back-to-back -back sessions, uh, they tend not to respond. I will say this too, though. It is specific to the individual. These can only be general guidelines, and there are... I, I'm, worked with uh, with elderly clients who can blow away young clients because they've been training across many years. Part of it will be uh, depending on when someone starts training. Now, you also have to consider the nutritional aspect. Uh, there is an anabolic resistance to protein intake. There's a blunted response. And uh, you see this graph on the right. This was a a study out of the lab of Luke Van Loon, a very good researcher in the Netherlands. And uh, he showed, a, as you can see, a dose response where placebo showed, of course, basically this was, uh, placebo was no protein, but post-workout protein provision, 15 grams is the great, the first bar, the C, the B is uh, 30 grams, and then 45 grams is G. So you see how there was a graded increased dose response to higher levels of protein. And it is theorized that this is due to the leucine threshold, that uh, elderly people uh, need higher amounts of per dose leucine to reach this threshold, which kickstarts the post-exercise muscle building process. Uh, the woman on the right is Ernestine Shepard. She is 80 years old. She's a living testament to showing what uh, regular resistance training can do. So in wrapping up and giving you the home points, after the age of 40, you're going to see a progressive loss of muscle mass, assuming you're sedentary uh, or, or have low levels of activity. That is called sarcopenia. Uh, even though the elderly do show a uh, attenuated, diminished hypertrophic response, they still can achieve, uh, they still can gain appreciable muscle if they are, if they adhere to regular resistance training. There is an impaired recovery response in the elderly, and thus uh, the frequency may need to be somewhat lower, perhaps two to three days a week, uh, depending on their experience. Uh, higher volumes are generally not as well tolerated, so as a general rule, you want to have lower, somewhat lower volumes, and again, it's all relative. Um, note that light loads can build in both young and old individuals, appreciable muscle, pretty much uh, equal amounts of muscle as heavier loads, and it's particularly important for the elderly because of their propensity towards osteoarthritis. And uh, generally, the elderly need higher per dose protein, or have higher dose per dose protein requirements to uh, optimize their post-exercise response. Okay, so... Uh, that is the presentation, and I will get back to the screen here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brad, sure. for this right. great presentation. It's always a pleasure to, to listen to you. So now is the time for Thomas' presentation. Please, Thomas. Yes, yeah, does anyone have any questions? The questions will be at the end of the of the session. Is it possible for you? Uh, what time will that be? It's in half an hour, something like this. Or do you prefer that doing right now? Yeah, because uh, I have a conference. I didn't realize. I thought that I was going to do the questions. Okay. I have a conference called eleven thirty. No, no problem. We can do we can do the question right now. Okay. Sure. So so. Uh, Please, if you have any questions, use the chat, put your name, uh, and do the question uh, uh, very, very concise, please.
These questions are only focused for, for Brad. Thank you. Uh, Brad, for stop sharing the screen, you have to click on the square uh, that it's in the upper right corner. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Where is upper right corner? I'm trying to. Uh, in the black space, you have a circle and inside a square there. Okay, uh -huh. thank you. Okay, thank you. Perfect. So, questions? Uh, how do I go back to uh, let's see, hold on. we have here uh, John West. We yeah, have... where's see the chat how do I get back to chat okay I, I can do the question Brad if you prefer okay yeah, if you prefer you can you can wait if you prefer yeah no no sure you can tell me what are the questions the, the first one is for uh, it's Alejandro Escobar. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Don't... So, what's the percentage of no responder? That? Yes. Yeah, say, uh, say the quote. What is the question? Oh, wait. Here's his chat. Uh, please oh. try to do the question more, more um, specific. So, this is very, very general. I saw no, one of the questions. I, think I, I, I saw a question. Uh, does, uh, would I include power training? Yeah, excellent question. I didn't have time to get into. I had to cut back on some of the slides because of the time requirement. But yes, elderly do benefit through uh, greater power training. Uh, and th there is strength, obviously, is very important. But um, there is evidence that there, it is even more important to uh, include some fast tempo training. Uh, meaning that the concentric portion is performed explosively. Now, when we're talking power training, I generally would not recommend or, or I would hesitate to use like Olympic lifting, but using more rapid uh, concentric movements, uh, so moving the weight more quickly on the concentric uh, in an explosive manner can help with uh, improving functional capacity and reducing the prospect of falls. Right. So here we have a lot of questions. For example, uh, Shonak Bhatia, to reduce sarcopenia, how should we alter protein intake? To reduce sarcopenia, how should we, uh, have what protein intake? Would be appropriate, okay. So uh, for elderly, it's really the same as, as far as total daily protein intake. Again, roughly the same as uh, for, young individuals, and that's around 1.6 to 1.8 uh, grams per kilogram uh, per day. Uh, that's for people who are resistance training. So the issue is more that elderly need higher per dose. It's not, you don't want to spread that out too much over the day. Uh, it wouldn't benefit you to spread it out, let's say, over five uh, meals. As I mentioned, there was the uh, study by Luke Van Loon that showed that a 45 gram dose so that's a fairly high dose, uh, would be best to maximize the protein synthetic response. So let's say you weigh 150 pounds, two, uh, three doses of 40 grams would be better than five doses of 25 grams, whatever it would be. Okay, thank you, Brad. Uh, another interesting question uh, from Pepe Garcia Carcel. Um, he said, uh, light loads are more suitable for elderly to to them being joint family. He asked if uh, blood from restriction protocols uh, are, are good or not. Uh, what do you think about this? Yeah, blood flow restriction is, excellent, is an excellent uh, tool to use. There's some limitations to it. Number one, it's really primarily limited to the extremities, to the arms and the legs. Uh, so you cannot really work the chest muscles to any substantial degree, the back muscles, uh, the sh shoulder muscles. Uh, so it's mostly for the arms and the legs. And, and with the elderly, the legs are probably the most important from a functional capacity. But still, I mean, obviously working the chest muscles and other is going to be important. 
Uh, there was some evidence that uh, there can be, you got to be careful as far as uh, potential vascular issues when you're used to, when the uh, pressure is too tight. So using uh, manual wraps, which a lot of people do, uh, you got to be careful with them because some people put them too tight. Uh, it's better to use a, uh, a cuff that can be inflated and that you know the pressure to inflate to. So if you're going to use a manual wrap, you really need to earn the side of caution and that can reduce the validity of, of using it. Thank you. Here we have another interesting question is, is there, is there any type of resistant training exercise that all people should avoid for their health? Um, well, I, I mean, that's always going to be, if you're just saying old, uh, being old in itself is not a contraindication per se. It has to really come down to what their comorbidities are. I mean, there would be, and that's far too uh, complex to get into, but I mean, diabetes or hypertension, there, there would be limitations, let's say, with hypertension. There would be certain limitations with potentially with diabetes. Uh, there would be limitations with joint-related factors. As I mentioned before, I generally would avoid using like Olympic-type lifts with uh, older individuals, as, particularly as they get very old, just because of the uh, strain to the joints, the potential for injury. But can you? Is that a uh, you know a no? I wouldn't say that that is for every, I would, I wouldn't say that there's no uh, uh, possibility that an older, older person could do that. So again, it's, oh, everything would be dependent on the individual. Uh, and we always have to make recommendations like that very cautiously. Okay, thank you very much. We have time for uh, the last one. The last question is for uh, Valentran. And I don't know if she or he. If we need to perform a Deloitte tweak for elderly population, will it be better, better to not reduce volume, intensity, frequency too much, considering that uh, they will lose strength, muscle faster than younger population? Uh, it's a really good question, but um, to be clear, the D, the detraining effect would be over the course of many weeks. A deload is, is a week period of time, one week period of time, uh, una semana. Yeah. Uh, and um, you're not going to see losses over the course of that short, very short periods of time, you do not see those types of losses. So when we talk about the negative effects of detraining, we're talking over many weeks, you know, a month, two months. Something like this pandemic would have been uh, the coronavirus issue where people did not train, they were in their houses and didn't train for a month or two months, that would be where you're going to see the real issues evolve with, um, you know, with this type of thing. But a deload would be pretty much the same as, as it would for someone who's younger. Okay, thank you very much, Brad. It's a pleasure to have you here. It's always a pleasure to talk with you, to chat, because we always learn a lot. We hope to have you here in Murcia very soon because we know that you are very, very familiar and that you enjoy a lot here. And of course, our students enjoy with your lessons and with everything around hypertrophy world. Thank you very much, Brad. I love uh, España and I am uh, very honored to be affiliated with the UPM program. So thank you, Pedro. And uh, you, you do great work. Uh, the school does great work. And again, it really is my pleasure. Thank you very much. See you soon. Yes. Take care and safe. Yep. Bye. So now it's time for Thomas Freitas from Ucan University. As I said before, he is strength and conditioning coach, uh, focus on basketball, and how now doing his researcher and teach the tool. And now he's focused on change of direction and he's doing a great work with top uh, athletes in in Brazil and here in Spain. So now he's going to show us the research he's doing on this topic. Uh, Thomas Fritas has the floor. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. Can, any, can you hear me? Yes, good? Yes, perfectly. Okay. 
Uh, first of all, I'm gonna share my screen. Let me let me know if you can see the presentation. Uh, can you see the screen? Yes, perfect. Yes. Okay. Uh, so first of all, I, I would like to thank Pedro and everybody in Ucam Sports Spanish Sports uh, University for the invitation to be here today. Uh, we'll, I'll be talking about change of direction in team sports, uh, assessment and training strategies. As Pedro said, um, I finished my PhD last year. Pedro was one of my uh, PhD supervisors and uh, it's an honor for me to be here and to be able to present some of the latest research we've been conducting. Um, okay, so we will start uh, by talking a little bit about change of direction in team sports and I'm gonna start by showing some videos to see actually if is it important or not or the, the ability to change direction does it influence sports performance. So. We have here some videos. Uh, in this case, I'm going to ask you to focus on the player on the left hand side is um, outside of the three point line and we'll see what he does and how he can get advantage uh, versus his uh, defender. OK, I will repeat again so we can see that he makes a quick change of direction that is sufficient to get him the advantage to get to the basket. OK, so it's an example of a change of direction action in a, in a in game scenario. Here we have also another video. This is from the final of the rugby 2019 World Cup, South Africa versus England. And we'll see how a change of direction. It's an explosive movement performed by the player getting the ball here and how we can get advantage to get the try following a change of direction here. Okay, so we can see, and we'll see a replay now, but we can see that following a change of direction or that action in which he changes movement direction, it's enough for him to get that slight advantage. Okay. And just another video, in this case in uh, American football, in which we will see also uh, an intense deceleration, which is an important part of change of direction as we were going to see. But we can see how he decelerates fast and gets the advantage over uh, his opponent. Okay, so, and we, we could be here looking at videos from different sports modalities all afternoon, but just to be sure that the change of direction is a change of direction actions and players, they change direction quite frequently during match play, okay? But first, um, before we get into the determinants and we'll talk a little bit about change of direction, I think it's important that we understand the difference between agility and change of direction, okay? So agility and change of direction, they are actually two independent skills. And this has different uh, implications for training and uh, for assessment, okay? So by agility, what the, According to the literature, agility consists of or can be defined as a rapid movement of the entire body with a change in speed or direction in response to an external stimulus. Uh, this, is, this stimulus may be a ball movement, uh, my teammates' movement, the opposing players, the opposing team player movement. And agility involves a change of direction, but as we said, in response to a stimulus. So in in-game situations, in competitive match play, what actually what the players or the, the ability that players utilize the most is agility because they don't know when they need to change direction and they do it in response to an external stimulus, okay? On the other hand, we have change of direction. And in literature, change of direction can be defined or has been defined as the set of skills and abilities that are needed to change movement direction, speed or mode. And in this case, when we talk about change of direction, we don't talk, um, we don't consider this decision making or these perceptual actions. Um, so there is a change of direction in which we can say it's in, uh, during a predefined task. Okay. So clearly, 
uh, we can we know from literature that change of direction and agility are two different concepts but if what we know that happens in competition it's uh, mainly agility type of actions so it's important to 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 understand or to study this change of direction okay some researchers they they believe and, and they defend that it's actually quite important to change to investigate this change of direction ability because it represents the physiological and mechanical basis that underpin the ability of players to perform successive uh, accelerations, decelerations in different directions and planes of movement. Uh, so actually it's important to understand this ability of change of direction because it can give us important information regarding, for example, the neuromuscular system or um, the ability of the players to support high entry velocities or to reaccelerate the body uh, fast. If we think about, for example, the counter movement jump, which is widely used in, in both research and in practical scenarios to, amongst other things, uh, to determine or to track uh, neuromuscular readiness by tracking uh, jump height, we can see if there's, there are any signs of fatigue or, or if the player is actually uh, able to or it's at, uh, at the appropriate level to 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 come to play um, but if we look at the execution of the counter movement jump we see that it's a jump with a hands on the hips uh, feet at the shoulder width and uh, both feet applying the same or seemingly the same amount of force to the ground at the same time so this never happens in competition, but nevertheless, we use this type of testing to get obtain information about uh, the neuromuscular system of the player. So we, we, we can think about change of direction um, in predetermined actions uh, similarly. Okay. Um, so as we can see from this from this uh, from this schematics from a, a paper by Shepard and Young in 2006, we can see that agility has two main components. On the left, we have the perceptual and decision-making factors, and on the right, we have this change of direction speed. And we are going to focus today mainly on this part, on change of direction speed. The first thing that I want you to understand is, as we can see here, there are multiple factors that explain why players are able to change direction faster. So it is actually a complex uh, skill. It's a complex athletic skill. And so we need to have this... Um, present when we develop training strategies with the aim at improving this ability to change direction okay if we talk about assessment and particularly code speed we can see that uh, traditionally the change of direction ability was assessed through test completion time what does this mean this means that we have an athlete perform a given change of direction test and the player that can finish the test or the, plan, or the player that finishes a test in the last amount of time is considered to have a superior performance. However, there is an important issue here, was identified by Nymphius in 2013 initially, that, for example, when we, we consider tests like the 505, which is a change of direction test of, um, with a 10 meter uh, total distance, we can observe, or the authors observe that for the total amount of test time, Players spent around 70% of the time in a linear sprinting action, and only 30% of the time the players were actually changing direction. So the authors, they make the question, what are we assessing then? If we are using a metric, total time, that only that um, from that total time of the test, only 30% it's actually changing direction, are we truly assessing change of direction, or is sprinting ability masking eventual um eventually deficiencies in the ability of an of a player to change direction so based on this the author proposed a new variable called the change of direction deficit pretty much what it what it means or what it represents is the additional time that is required to make a directional change compared to the time needed to cover the same distance in linear sprint so if we have a change of direction test the 505 what we to calculate the cut deficit, we have to calculate to perform the 505 tests, get the time, then we perform another separate 10 meter sprint tests, and then the difference between in this between the time of these two tests would be change of direction deficit. Or we can also calculate, and we can see it on in the literature that there's a 
a difference as a difference in velocity. In this case, if we consider the 505, we will have to calculate the velocity um, 10 meter sprint, and we'd have to subtract the velocity of the 505, and we would get a, um, a metric which is a change of direction deficit. There's slight differences between using one and the other, and we have recently submitted a, a paper on this, and hopefully it will be out in a, in a few few months. Okay, and later we can discuss a little bit about it. The card deficit, according to the to the authors, they it allows ass assessing change of direction as a separate skill, independent of linear sprint capabilities. And it can also be seen as a complementary approach to assess the efficiency to change direction, which means that if an athlete has a lower change of direction deficit, it means that he is more efficient changing direction with respect to his maximum sprinting velocity, which means that the difference in time or the difference in velocity between a change of direction action and the linear sprint is shorter, so it's smaller. This is why we consider it has a higher efficiency to change direction. Okay. In this, in this study in 2016, what the authors did was they, they tried to assess change of direction ability using either the 505 total time or the 505 cut deficit. We can see here in, 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 um, in gray. And the authors identified uh, that there were particular cases of individual athletes in which they were below the average using the change of direction deficit or above the average when they use the, the 505 total time. So we can see that using one or the other will not always give us the same, um, will not always give us the same um, information. So the authors, they recommend the use of this change of direction deficit as a complementary approach to allow a more isolated measure of change of direction uh, ability, okay? So now that I, we've made a, a brief introduction about this metric, I'm going to discuss a little bit the latest findings of our research group. As Pedro said, we've been collaborating with people uh, in Brazil, uh, Irineus Lo Turco Center in, in Sao Paulo, and uh, we have conducted a fairly amount of research on this ability to change direction, particularly in high-level uh, sports. And from all the studies we have been, uh, we had um, have collected data, it seems we've been finding a, a quite interesting trend which is that faster, stronger, and more powerful athletes, they tend to present higher cut deficits, which means that athletes that are able to jump or higher or sprint faster, they tend to present higher cut speeds, velocity to change direction, when we consider total time or, or, or average velocity, but they also present higher cut deficits. So in practical terms, what this means, it's that it seems that faster, stronger, and more powerful athletes, they tend to be less efficient to change direction with respect to their maximum sprinting speed. And this is interesting because this makes us wonder if we are uh, developing this ability to change direction um, or this, uh, if we are developing our athletes or making them uh, able to be faster, but at the same time, uh, change direction more efficiently, okay? I'm going to go now through some of our recent studies. In this case, what we did was we we we, come, we used a, a sample of professional soccer players and we assessed sprint velocity, linear sprint velocity. We divided the sample into two groups, the high acceleration group and the lower acceleration group, and we compared to see um, if there were differences between these groups. Obviously, in five meter sprint velocity and in um, in five meter sprint velocity, in 20 meter sprint velocity, the higher acceleration group obtained better uh, results. If we take a look at the COD velocity, also it seems that the faster acceleration group, they also obtain faster COD speeds. But then when we take a look at the COD deficit, what we observe is that there's a tendency for the athletes that are faster or with higher acceleration capabilities to be less efficient at changing direction. And this is quite interesting because what this tells us is that just because you are faster accelerating, that does not mean that you are uh, more efficient to change direction, okay? Um, obviously, if we take, this is a tendency, so we are like looking at group averages, but obviously when we work with individual athletes, what, what we need to understand or what we should try to understand is why this athlete has a higher acceleration 
and has a lower cut deficit than, for example, this guy, which has a lower acceleration and a higher um, cut deficit. So, but this is at the individual level, and we don't have enough time to go into this much detail in terms of technical execution or uh, biomechanical analysis of the change of direction, but it's important to understand that we're talking about a trend, okay? This is another study. What we did, we divided the group into, um, into two again, this time based on their squat when I ran, elite uh, team sport athletes, and based on also on jump squat. And what we identified was that the athletes with a higher when I ran, they were faster in linear actions, they were faster in change of direction speed, but they had or they presented a higher cut deficit. And similarly, the players, the more powerful players, they uh, found, we found a similar trend in which they were faster, they were able to jump higher, but they also were less efficient at changing direction, okay? And we tried to understand on a different study what could be one of the potential reasons why this happens, and then we were interested in understanding this variable, which is called the sprint momentum, and how it may influence this inefficiency or efficiency to change direction. In this study, uh, we compared female and male uh, professional rugby players. And what we found was that the athletes, the male athletes, they presented higher cut deficits than the female athletes, and they also present higher um, sprint momentums. So it seems that. The sprint momentum um, is associated to a higher cut deficit, and it may be because there's this mechanical consequence of being faster, which means that if you are faster, uh, you have a higher momentum, and if you have a higher momentum, you have a higher inertia to overcome. So you have a higher quantity of movement that you need to decelerate and then reaccelerate into the new direction. Also, studies from these guys, uh, from guys in the UK, they, they also suggest that um this may be due to an in a uh, difficulty of players to um a difficulty of players to handle high entry velocities and that's why or it may be one of the reasons why faster athletes are less efficient at changing direction now it's it's very very important to understand one thing here when we say that faster athletes they tend to present higher cut deficits or stronger athletes they tend to present higher cut deficits that does not mean that we as strength and conditioning coaches should strive to have or should avoid having our athletes become faster or should avoid having our athletes become stronger or more powerful. What we need to understand is that if we have players that are able to accelerate really, really fast and achieve high velocities, we need to make sure that they are able to decelerate those velocities that are able to support that those um, entry velocities and reaccelerate in different directions. Okay, if we think about, for example, uh, an, a Formula One car, if you have a big engine and if you want your car to be to win competitions, your car needs to be really, really powerful. You need to have horsepower and be able to accelerate. But you also need to have your, um, your engineers working on your braking system because you have a huge engine, but you don't have a braking system, you cannot properly drive a car. And then also, it's really, really important, the driver, if you have two guys on the same in, in the exact same Formula One car, one it's highly uh, one is a professional driver and the other one is not a professional driver. Even if they have the same horsepower and the same braking system, if they are not able to properly uh, control the car in those faster velocities. Meaning, if they don't have the skills to do it, they are not efficient at driving. And this is, if we think about athletes, it's the same. Okay, so. Let's talk a little bit about these training strategies. Uh, based on the recent research and our findings, and not only from our research group, but from other research groups working on this, um, should we rethink current training approaches? What we mean is that should we maybe focus on more eccentric strength type of training or reactive strength if we want to have our, our faster athletes also be efficient at changing direction? Should we try to have more cost specific exercises, both in, uh, on, on the court or on, uh, on the field, but also in a more gym-based setting? Are we giving enough attention to code technique to, uh, to explain and teach our athletes how to properly change direction from a technical 
uh, standpoint, particularly those of those of you, those of us that work in uh, academies and younger athletes, are we devoting enough time on this change of direction uh, technique? And the other question, the last question that we are still trying to answer is if change of direction deficit is it trainable or is there or is it just a consequence of being faster and you are faster you will always have more cut deficit and you just need to deal with it um yeah recent studies have suggested or suggest that we may be be able to increase this change of direction deficit but more research is clearly warranted okay if we think about changing uh, training to improve change of direction speed and change of direction ability the first thing that most researchers agree is that we need to have a uh, an approach towards strength training with accentuated muscle actions so as you can see here in this image so let me see your brakes are bad so if we want to be able to want to have our athletes able to support high entry velocities into change of direction we need to make sure that they are able to decelerate and therefore they need to be able to produce high amounts of extent force and breaking forces into the ground okay as we can see these actions they actually need high and fast velocity eccentric actions and athletes they need to improve this ability to decelerate on this ability to decelerate there's these guys in the uk as well they're doing huge and super interesting studies on the main determinants of deceleration um, how should we work and what's the frequency of decelerations during match play and, and so on. And it's very, very interesting. I'm showing you some videos now of some of the work we do in our basketball club. And I'm almost, um, I'm almost done with the presentation. Okay, we can see here some kind of eccentric exercise with a kind of an eccentric muscle action, accentuated eccentric muscle action, okay, by using unilateral exercises, in this case, the medicine ball. We can also use uh, elastic bands to increase this eccentric loading here. Obviously, if you have the ability to use yo-yo, uh, flywheels, uh, all these kind of uh, machines that produce a an, an highly accentuated eccentric muscle action, it has also been shown to have really, really good effects on change of direction speed. Okay, this is a, a study we did here in our in our lab in which we, we compared different types of resistant exercise. We had four different groups and one of the groups they used a weighted vest and we compared between groups a weighted vest and a electromechanical system that produces uh, horizontal resistance. And what we found is that utilizing a weighted vest may be a very, very good option to increase the change of direction speed and to decrease the change of direction deficit because when we are utilizing this weighted vest what we are doing is we are increasing the load and we, by increasing the load we are increasing the uh, momentum so there is a higher need to decelerate and in this study we had our players perform uh, sprint and change of direction uh, uh, tests testinal exercises using this weighted vest and we found that this may be a good strategy to use okay another the aspect is strength stabilization according to the literature so uh, we can see that studies they they say that strength stability during change of direction is an important factor in the change of direction performance and when we check when we as coaches when we work this kind of uh, change of direction actions we should check the body posture and trunk movement of our players very very important we don't have time to go into detail here but uh, change of direction is a whole body movement it's not only a lower body okay so we need to focus not only on the lower body but also on the trunk this is really really important some exercises here we can see some unilateral exercises here this exercise is it forces the athlete to have a higher neuromuscular control of the pelvis also the trunk it's in a inclined position so it's kind of challenging here, anti-rotation movements, also working on the core and the stabilization of these trunk muscles, okay? And finally, just to say that, uh, at least to our knowledge, this is the first study uh, by the scientists and collaborators that uh, investigated the change of direction, tech, specific change of direction technique um, interventions and see if it's, if it's possible to reduce cut deficits and actually 
They found a reduction in the cod deficit after six weeks of training and no changes in spring time. So this, if we combine these two findings, it means that the, the athletes became more efficient at changing direction because this, de this decrease in change of direction deficit was not because there was a decrease in sprint time, but because there was a higher uh, velocity while changing direction, okay? So as take home messages, agility and change of direction, two independent uh, skills. We talked today just about change of direction. The cut deficit is an important variable. It has been suggested to be a measure to be able to to represent the efficiency to change direction, but also to be better uh, or more suitable, more sensitive to detect directional dominance and asymmetries. We didn't, have, we didn't have time to go into this. Is it trainable? We don't know yet, at least at the higher professional level. At the younger categories, it seems it's trainable. Uh, we should, when we assess change of direction, do a quantitative assessment, but also a qualitative assessment is fundamental. We did not cover this, but uh, using video, using some more biomechanical type of analysis to actually understand the movement mechanics of our athletes is fundamental. And if we talk about training, uh, eccentric training, exercises that stabilize uh, trunk, focus on change of direction technique, and unilateral strength training, they seem to be important aspects associated to an improved change of direction ability. Okay, this is it. Uh, thank you very much. I went a bit fast in the end, and still I think I went over the time, so I'm sorry for that, Jose Carlos, Pedro, and uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tomas. Uh, now it's time for Costas Spirus. Costas Spirus has a scholarship for doing research in futsal in our research center. He was a student in our high performance sport master. And now he's, he's going to talk about the latest research about futsal that we are doing with top professionals in, in futsal players. Please. Uh, Hi, Pedro. Us. Do you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, everything is all right? Is it working? Perfect, perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro. As uh, Pedro said, I did a master in uh, high performance in sports, uh, strength and conditioning in, uh, by UCAM Spanish Sports Universities in two 2017. And I'm currently I'm a, I'm a PhD student and collaborating with a futsal team about the high performance in uh, futsal. <clears throat> Today, I'm going to speak about the current load monitoring practices in elite futsal. I'm going to briefly introduce about the, the characteristic of futsal, uh, that it's a high intensity intermittent sport. The mean heart rate is above 85% and uh, VO2 max more than 80% during the game. The players cover around uh, three to four kilometers, that uh, around 12% uh, percent of them are in a high intensity activity and 5% uh, uh, percent of them is uh, sprinting. And then they perform around 26 sprints that uh, with distance 10.5 meters and recovery between them 15 seconds. All of this data is, uh, was collected uh, by time motion analysis. And uh, nowadays it's more uh, team sports are used to use uh, micro technology as uh, GPS or accelerometers. For player tracking technology, uh, we are using the Optima S5 by Catapult to, to collect the external load. The external load is the uh, you could collect the number of accelerations, the accelerations, change of directions, uh, jumps, the player load, the distance, the velocity, and etc. And the GPS and accelerometers. In our case, uh, as if uh, as futsal is an indoor sport, we are using accelerometer because the GPS. Uh, for indoor sports, needs the, the facility needs to have an antenna in order to get the signal for the distance and velocity. However, by accelerometer as well, it's a valid, a reliable method. So why do we monitor the, the load? First of all, to determine adaptations to training programs. 
to detect individual response to training and competition, assess recovery and fatigue, minimize the risk of injuries, and lastly, and lastly, return to play safely from injuries. What do we measure? Uh, by the way, this is a highly recommended book for every strength and, uh, strength and condition coach and sports scientist, Measure What Matters by John Doerr. Uh, in our case, we look for a total player load, player load per minute, acceleration, the numbers of accelerations, the accelerations, repeated high intensity efforts, <clears throat> and running imbalance. But all of these variables, we collect them through games, training sessions, and rehab sessions. About the games, we have the competition that uh, it's from first and the second half. It's 20 minutes every half with 10 minutes break. And we collect the external load. We analyze and they, then we give a feedback about the physical activity of the, of the competition, taking into consideration context or factor as the opponent home away, if we played home or away, results and score. So the, result, the feedback that we give uh, back is, the, as you can see here in the graph, uh, the green column is the volume and the blue line is the intensity. And you could see here the first part of, and the second part of a game. And you could see how, you could see how the volume and the intensity decreased in the, from first to the second half. Definitely uh, fatigue uh, plays a role. However, we have seen that the technical aspects and tactical aspects, as uh, that everybody who is familiar from futsal, the players tend uh, the team that lose tends to play with a fifth player as an on-court player than um, uh, in order to have an advance. Okay, so and we uh, we will see later as well how this affects the intensity and the volume of the game. Then again, with the games, we are here to see how we collect and we compare every game with the rest in order to explain it and understand uh, some of the aspects. And here as well, we compare the first and the second part in the player load per minute from all the games. And uh, it's interesting, as you, you could see, that the two of the uh, halves, the second half and the third one is slightly lower than the first half, is a higher than the than the first, is a higher, the, the payload per minute, the intensity is a higher in the second half than in the first one. And we have seen that uh, when the score is close, the intensity in the second half uh, didn't decrease than uh, than normal. In three scores, we won for just for one goal. About the training session, as uh, we have the preparation also, uh, from the players and the strength and conditioning coach and the uh, manager of the team collect, select the exercises that are tactical, physical, or technical. And we collect the external load and the physical activity of these exercises. And we're going back to the exercises in order to see if we did what we planned uh, to do. And we succeed in our target. Here in this graph, uh, you could see what I said before, how this is uh, four exercises in the, with a red line. And you could see that two exercises is a real game than five versus four. And you could see with a red line how the volume and the intensity is decreasing when we change the technical, when uh, we put in the training session uh, technical aspects. Then about uh, in the training session, here you could see two different training sessions. Uh, all of the training sessions are separated uh, in the warm up and main part. And uh, there is two different uh, training sessions. In the first one, you could see uh, that the intensity is much higher than the other one. And on the other hand, the volume is uh, higher than, uh, than the other one. So here we collect the exercises and we look if we, pl if we did what we plan to do. And this one gives us a really good feedback 
about the strength and conditioning coach and the manager of the team if we are if they you know physical activity and external load we did what we planned uh, to do about uh, individually for every player here every column corresponds to one player and again there is the volume and the intensity after a game and uh, we collect the volume and the intensity of every player of course with the time that they played and the repeated high intensity efforts the numbers of uh, accelerations decelerations explosive movement and change of directions the dance is uh, including in explosive mo movements in uh, here in our team and then the strength and conditioning coach separate uh, the players in two groups the group one who is doing the first training after the match who is doing a rehabilitation session than the group two that uh, uh, is doing compensate uh, compensate training in order to get the stimulus that didn't that didn't from the match about the injury prevention we are using the metrics of catapult the running in balance and uh, you could see here that two players presented fourth, uh, four and uh, three percent uh, imbalance in the left side compared to the right. And when we detect uh, this kind of imbalance, we speak with the uh, physio and the strength and conditioning coach if the player needs to do a rehabilitation session or participating much less minutes than, uh, than a normal training or to do a resistance training. So, and interestingly, interestingly, we found in a, with a player who, who was injured for five months in the Achillum tendon, when he returned to do the first training session, if, even if he had all the physical aspects, jumps, sprinting, change of directions, the running imbalance between the two limbs uh, displayed more than uh, 7%. So this uh, metric, we helped us a lot to rethink and uh, prevent it from re-injury and if he is ready to return to play about uh, the return to play here uh, <clears throat> you see the player who was injured for five months the grease cycle the grease cycle is the first and the second part of the game before get injured and then uh, with a red line with a red side uh, right cycle you could see the player, the intensity, the volume of the first game after the injury. And uh, as a team, we're using the time restriction to play that it's uh, common in uh, team sports and most often uh, is used to do in uh, NBA and the basketball, that the player has a limit na a time of uh, to play in order to get the stimulus of the uh, to get the stimulus of the competition because we have seen i think uh, is in all in all the sports that the competition stimulus you can't get it from uh, training even for friendly match and here you could see how we try to to get the volume and the intensity gradually a uh, game after a game until to get the 100 percent to be in the competition uh, st uh, to get the competition stimulus and uh, without having re-injury. About the data visualization, and I think this is the one of the most important thing because there are a lot of people with different uh, duties, different backgrounds, different knowledge. So the data visualization, as uh, coach told me directly, that helps me to take a decision. Uh, I think plays a crucial role how you don't how you demonstrate the data. So uh, we're using four different uh, softwares, the Power BI, Tableau, Catapult software, and Excel. Depends on what do we want to demonstrate, with whom, when, and where. And uh, lastly, in conclusion, at the end of the day, as a sports scientist, we should have a common sense and communication skill because a weak link between communications could affect negative, negatively the negative the the team every we should know that every player is individual we don't compare the data between the players uh, data helps to take a, a decision sports gives an advice 
and go take a decision. And I'm gonna finish with my favorite quote that uh, from Edward uh, Deming, that in God we trust, all other must bring uh, data. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you, Ocam Spanish Sports University, for this uh, chance to present the work that we are doing. Uh, and that's it. I think I spoke a little bit fast in order to compensate the, the Thomas time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Costas. So now uh, it's time for Jose Carlos is going to present some of our programs. Meantime, you have uh, you have time to, to chat your questions, please. Um, so, Jose Carlos, please, and thank you very much, of course, to Thomas and to Costas for the, the nice presentation with this interesting uh, data. Okay, thank you very much, Pedro. Um, let me also say thank you to Thomas, Costas, and Brad for for sharing all the knowledge with us and congratulations for a great presentation you have you have done uh yes while our attendees are preparing some questions let's speak a little about the ucam spanish for university uh we are a postgraduate school and we are uh, focused in the developing the developing the programs related with uh, sport management, communication, and administration areas of the sport industry, and also programs related with um, the support sciences for sports uh, performance. Uh, in, if we talk about this second area of our university, we have a lot of programs related with the sports uh, performance. Uh, some of them are teach in Spanish, and uh, also we have programs teached in English. Uh, as you can see, we have programs related with uh, strength and conditioning, nutrition, uh, psychology, physiotherapy, and also related with uh, football. And talking about this one, we have, if you are interested in this uh, sport, in football or soccer, if you are an American speaker, um, you, we have the master in strength and conditioning in football and rehabilitation from injuries in, in this sport. Uh, this program is obviously focused on the training for football. Uh, it's one year long and uh, we start each year uh, normally in October. You will have 11 sessions. Uh, each session is uh, two days. Um, Friday and Saturdays, more or less even every three weeks. And in this program, you will have the opportunity to see different areas related with this sport, training methodology, planning control and assessment on training load, injury prevention training, sport nutrition, uh, rehabilitation from injuries, uh, and also a, a training a programming. Uh, for this, we have uh, great teachers. All of them uh, are working in the professional sector of the football, in football teams. Uh, and also they have a very uh, experienced academic career. So we try to combine every time the theoretical part of these uh, subjects with the uh, practical uh, things that we you can develop when you are training, when you are doing the real work. So it's uh, great for us having these uh, teachers. And also this program uh, we have is the unique program in Spain uh, and that we do visits and tours uh, to different football clubs of the first and second division in Spain. Uh, in this kind of activities, in these visits, we used to see the trainings of the of the first teams and also we have different lectures from uh, professionals that are working in the clubs nutritionists uh, physiotherapists uh, also conditioning uh, strength and conditioning coaches uh, and we also see the facilities that the clubs uh, have so it's the unique program that have this kind of uh, activity 
And also uh, talking about our former students, we have the privilege to have some of them already working in football teams, in very in football teams of the first division and second division. So for us, it's very, it's very, uh, we are very happy about this. Uh, and and also they are they have achieved their 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 goal. So it's great for us. And on the other hand, we also have the master's degree in high performance in sport, strength and conditioning. This program is developed in uh, Spanish and English. And uh, for us, this is a very good uh, opportunity to share with you this program because today's lecture, today's masterclass is related also with this, with this area. Uh, it's a university master's degree. We, develop, we, we do it in, in the campus of Murcia. And in this program, you can see all these subjects and you can learn uh, from also great teachers as, uh, for example, Brad Schoenfield, he's been with us today, Pedro Alcaraz, uh, director also of the program, and too many teachers that always try to use the theoretical part of the of the sport performance um, uh, researching and they try to uh, transmit it for for a practical way so it's it's great to do this this way and also for the next year we have an agreement with Barça Innovation Hub and the uh, the students that will be with us for the next year we also have uh, uh, the opportunity to do some of the sports sciences courses that Barça Innovation Hub uh, has. So they provide, as you can see, a lot, many, many certificates and many courses uh, related with the sports sciences areas. Um, if you want more info about all of this, please, uh, you can visit our web page. And also, if you need more or further information, please email us to sportsuniversity at ucam.edu. Thank you very much. Uh, now we are going to open the, the chat. So if you want to write uh, some questions to our speakers, let me please tell you some rules uh, we only are going to attend the questions from people who are registered with real names. And please, when you write the question, tell uh, who is the question for. And we also appreciate if you write it uh, well and if the question is specific for the speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jose Carlos. Uh, as you can see here, our master program are, are top. So I hope if you have any question, feel free to ask us, because we have, uh, uh, not only on, in the strength and conditioning in soccer and high performance sport, we have different programs with sport nutrition, sport management, in sport psychology, so uh, health and sport. So feel, feel free to ask us in this uh, email and we will be very happy to answer your questions. So now it's time for questions. Jose Carlos. Yes, we have one from Michael Oinkle. Oil, oil, sorry, I cannot, I don't know how to say correctly the surname. Uh, Thomas, thanks for the great presentation. My question is there. Is there a higher risk of injury when training with a uh, weighted uh, vest as a uh, means to improve COD? Uh, thanks for, for the question. Thanks, uh, Michael. Interested. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting question. Obviously, if you, if you are going to put an, an overload on a, on a specific movement, if the athlete does not have the the structures and the neuromuscular system um, developed enough for that overload, for that specific overload, it may indeed increase uh, risk of injury. Importantly, in, in the study we did, we, we did not use uh, we did not use high 
high uh, loads. We the highest we went was 20% body mass, and it was just in a specific week of intervention or two weeks of the intervention. If I if I don't if I'm not wrong. So if there is a slight overload, it, there won't be an an and given and from assuming that our athletes are already proficient at performing these specific movements and from a technical point of view there's not a reason for this to be particularly harmful but yeah obviously you need to make sure to select adequately which athletes you are going to apply that specific overload and which you you look and by looking at their uh, movement mechanics from a qualitative point of view uh, you may choose not to implement a specific uh, specific overload as the weighted vest. I don't know if I answered your question. Okay, thank you. Let's go for for another one and this one is for Costas uh, from Aitor Andres Moran. How do you measure running imbalance of the players? Yeah, uh, the running balance we measured by the accelerometer and uh, is breaking down a, into an event by event basis, which is uh, with uh, a, a negative running imbalance by percent is indicative of he per percent and uh, um, yeah, by the triaxonal accelerometry. I don't know if I could uh, answer him. You could find uh, more information about uh, in the catapult training system that shows exactly the methods that they are using. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's go back to Tomas. To Tomas, uh, one question from Pepe Garcia. If we implement a training plan consisting on close to one RM training as well as power training in order to optimize neural adaptation while avoiding hypertrophic gains, could that weigh uh, the bad aspects related to a sprint moment be avoided as uh, less body mass in being involved? So I don't know if you can, Thomas, read the question. Yes, yes, I read the question. Uh, thanks, Pepe, for the question. Yeah, interesting question. So we need to understand first the context in which we are using, and also we need to understand that the the momentum does not affect equally all change of direction because due to the specificity of changes of direction. What, what I mean is if if our athletes, they perform mainly uh, as part of their in-game role, change of direction of uh, low angles, below 45 degrees mainly, uh, velocity maintenance is a key determinant of performance because there's not that much need to decelerate, so the momentum could actually be beneficial. However, if an athlete needs to perform high um, and sharp change of direction, for let's say 90 degrees, 180 degrees, obviously the higher the momentum, the higher the braking forces that need to be applied. And depending on the context, for example, in rugby, momentum is fundamental, okay? Momentum is, is fundamental because uh, players need to be able to run fast and they also need to be able to have a, a, a specific uh, body structure that, that enables these athletes to support high impacts, okay? Now, obviously, if you see that there is, uh, if the sprint momentum is actually making your athlete less efficient to change direction, one strategy obviously is to uh, optimize uh, body composition. And if you want to increase strength, Without any hypertrophic gains, yes. In, if that's the particular case, it could be a good option. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Tomas. Uh, let's go for another one to uh, Costas uh, from Pepe Garcia again. Uh, it is concerning leg strength training at football uh, futsal elite elite players. Considering knee injuries are common in this sport, which exercises would you recommend in order to achieve proper quad or bicep femoris uh, development when there are a uh, limitation on leg uh, flexion? That's a good uh, question because it's true that uh, we have a lot of knee injuries in, uh, in futsal. 
and uh, I didn't uh, get inside about the strength training that they, they are performing. Uh, they are doing twice a week and we're using uh, uh, all of uh, uh, strength training uh, mostly with free weights and then some machines for a complementary training. And, uh, and then we, we use a lot of power exercises. Okay, thank okay. you very much uh, for the answer. Uh, a question from Dr. Miguel Gonzalez to Thomas. What would be the different strength training for an athlete with diabetes and for a normal healthy athlete? Hi, uh, nice question. Actually, I, I'm not a, an expert in training athletes with, uh, with diabetes, but assuming that uh, if it's type 1 diabetes and assuming that they have their insulin uh, levels controlled and that they are um, and everything and uh, everything is under control, they, uh, there's no reason why we should have a fairly different uh, resistance training program or strength training program. But as I said before, I, I wouldn't consider myself an expert, so uh, I don't know if I if I can be the most adequate to answer that that question. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, also, another one for you uh, from Armando Abram. Uh, and do you have any knowledge of COD research in water sport? meaning chain of the electron using the upper body instead of the legs, for example, in sport like surfing? Uh, good question. Uh, no, I actually, I don't. Uh, all my research is on uh, multi-directional uh, fields or uh, court sports, uh, basketball, rugby, uh, soccer. So I don't know, uh, I, I would not be able to answer you as the main determinants of changing direction in, 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 in surfing, for example. And I would have to, to read on the, the subject before I can give you any, uh, any specific answer to your question. I'm sorry, I, I can help you in, with that. Uh, this is easier, I think, for you. Um, very practical for, uh, for us. Uh, from Justin and Stephen, uh, what types of COD tests would you recommend for team sports the early session considering the time consuming and would you prefer using the test that includes uh, the high number of COD tests or a low number of COD tests? Uh, that's a really, really good question. So as we know, uh, assessing uh, players, it's really, really important, but it's also, as you said, uh, time consuming. Yeah. So what type of sports um, what type of tests do you do you recommend? It depends uh, on the sport. It depends on the the position within within the field. But my, if I have any recommendation, I would recommend that you should do uh, tests for both sides. You can either do a 505 tests to one side or the other, uh, and to one side and the other to determine not only efficiency to change direction, but also um, questions related to asymmetries and or lateral dominance. Um, for example, in our basketball club, what we do is we, we do a 90 degree change of direction, 10 meter total distance with one change of direction of 90 degrees. So five meters and then five meters after a change of direction. Because by talking with the coaching staff and by talking with the um, um, uh, by talking with the coaching staff and strength and conditioning coach, we decided that that would be the, the change of direction that would most represent, most be most representable from the movement actions of most players. So that's the one we choose. And um, we try to do this type of testing and assessment uh, in during the season regularly to try and, and obtain uh, information of how this is evolving and so on. And also because we have now an interesting study that we did under review and, and we found that uh, uh, in, a, in a sample of soccer players, elite soccer players, after a congested match period in which they played 
if I don't, if I'm not mistaken, they played uh, 14 games in uh, seven weeks, so two games per week, and we measured uh, their performance in linear sprint, curves, curvy linear sprint, vertical jump, and change of direction tests, and we observed that there were important declines in uh, straight sprinting speed, but also they became less efficient at change direction. So the cut deficit was uh, affected more to a greater extent, the change of direction was affected to a greater extent than the linear sprint velocity. So it's also important to have this into consideration when we think about assessing and uh, during the season. But good, good question. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so we have been more time than expected doing this uh, masterclass. Uh, we don't have more questions. So I will like to, again, say thank you to our speakers. Uh, say thank you to all of you. Um, Pedro, if you want to also say goodbye to the attendees, uh, we can start ending the, the session. OK, thank you, Jose Carlos. So thank you to all of you for being here with us. And it's a real pleasure to to, to have you here at Ucan Spanish Sport University. We feel that uh, your, your time is very important for us. And for that reason, we appreciate that you want to share your time in learning for, uh, from top uh, researchers and professors from our uh, master degrees. So if you are interested on those programs, feel free to contact us and we will be more than happy to have you in, in giving all the information. Thank you much and we see you very soon. Thank you.